Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a few moments ago. We're over in the book of Exodus. We're in Exodus chapter 15. There are Bibles under the seats in front of you if you'd like to follow along in the text as we study. Exodus chapter 15, we're looking again at verses 1 through 21, part 9 of Sing Unto the Lord. We're going to have at least 10 parts to this. So uh, a lot of biblical principles apply to music. Now, someone said last week, well, you know, why am I trying to, you know, teach you guys to love classical music? I'm not. I'm trying to teach you biblical principles that you can apply both to classical music, contemporary music, Baroque music, Renaissance music, whatever kind of music, uh, the Romantic era, the Impressionistic era, uh, the modern era with people like John Cage. Uh, I mean, biblical principles apply to music. Music is one of the key elements of worship. And so we need to understand those principles, and then, as we learn the principles, we can apply them to every composer, we can apply them to every musician, the artists who play the compositions, we can apply them to the words that are used in context with the music that is used, whether or not that's a proper balance. Uh, many important principles in the Word of God. We'd gotten down to principle number 10 last week, which is music and junk. Don't give God your junk, give Him your best. Somebody else may have something better, but he doesn't require somebody else's something from you. He requires from you your best. What talents, what gifts, what abilities has he given to you? If he gave somebody else greater talents than they gave that, that would be them giving junk. But that's not how God looks at it. God looks at it as giving him your best. And that relates to your musical gifts as well as other gifts that God has given to you. And I encourage you once again, everybody, be on time because the first part of the service is where we worship God with music. And that's an important part of it. Now, I gave some illustrations about how God does not despise the small things. One illustration from the Old Testament, one illustration from the New Testament, where we should not give God our junk, but it's not a matter of how much, it's a matter of whether or not we've given him our best. The Old Testament, God talked about in Malachi, a son honors his father, a servant his master. If I be a father then, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear, saith the Lord of hosts? Unto you, O priests, that despise my name, and say, where have we despised my name? Because you've offered polluted bread on my altar. Give him the moldy bread. God doesn't need the good bread. We'll give him moldy bread. I mean, after all, it's just going to sit on the table in there in the tabernacle. Giving God their junk. And they say, wherein we've polluted thee, and that we've polluted the... Uh, you say, the table of the Lord is contemptible. If ye offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? In other words, give him your crummy animals. If ye offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it now to thy governor, will be he pleased with thee? What if you went to visit the President of the United States? You got a personal invitation to go visit the President of the United States. thought, I'm going to bring him a nice, nice gift. So you look around the kitchen, and you think... Well, you know, I just bought a new loaf of bread for myself, but I got one that's got some mold on it in the refrigerator. I think I'll take him the moldy bread, and I do have a, you know, a, a chunk of meat here in the refrigerator. It looks like it's starting to get old. I'll take him that. Do you think he would be pleased? Would he? Why do we think God would be pleased if we give him our junk? Uh, I told you about a guy in my church years and years ago who always gave his used junk to God when he got himself something new so he could get a tax receipt for the old stuff. Because, you know, when you give a gift in kind, you can write off the value yourself. You declare it yourself. Church doesn't have to, uh, they'll give you a receipt to say thank for your gift, but then you're the one that gets to determine the value of the gift and just hope the IRS does not come and audit you. <laughs> Jesus also had something about giving our best to God, even though it may not be much, over in Mark 20, uh, 12, excuse me, and he said unto them in his doctrine, Beware of the scribes, which love to go in long clothing, and love salutations in the marketplaces, and the chief seats in the synagogue, and the uppermost feasts at room, uh, rooms at feasts, which devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. These shall receive the greater damnation. And Jesus sat over against the treasury, and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury, and many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in Two mites, which make a farthing. It's like four cents. And he called unto him his disciples and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow has cast in more than all they which have cast into the treasury. 
For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. She gave her best. If a rich guy had thrown in four cents, it would have been contemptible. But they threw in a lot of money, but it really didn't affect them because they had so much. But she threw in all that she had. Eleventh, and this is one of the most important sections that we'll be dealing with in the whole series. Last week we looked at music and language and what is the music saying across the cultures. It's very important. Remember we talked about some time ago strange fire to the Lord. When we apply that principle to music, we can ask some questions. Since music is a universal language, it transcends cultures. You can understand music that was written in Austria and France and music that was written in Japan, music that was written in China, music that was written in South America. You can understand it, you can hear it, you can listen to it. You can evaluate it. It is transcultural. It's a universal language. It communicates something about the culture and the context in which the music was developed. So to test the music, I gave you some questions last week to ask. First, how was this music originally used in the culture where it originated? Number two, did those who developed these forms of music use them to glorify God or to worship demons? In other words, is this form of music strange fire? Number three, even if this particular music did not spring directly out of pagan worship, is it the fruit of that kind of music brought to full bloom? You know, there are over, and I think I told you this last week, there are over 300 different distinct forms and genre of music that are clearly defined and that have specific elements that set them apart from all other forms of music. And I gave you some illustrations of that last week. So the question we raised at the end of that was, how do we know what we can use? What's dangerous to use? Because our bottom line principle was doing doing all to the glory of God. Yeah, you do all to the glory of God. That applies to music too. Because music is one of the principal elements of worship. We talked about the great music with its fountainhead in the Protestant Reformation that had transformative power over evil music that sprang from demon-worshipping tribes. Reformed theology and the great post-Reformation musicians such as Bach and Handel who sprang out of that history affected generations of later musicians and creatively established the highest forms of what is called Baroque, musical structures upon which the Rococo classical romantic musical periods and so on have been built. And I gave you an illustration of a friend of mine, one of my teachers back in Israel many, many years ago, who had been missionaries to the, at that time, Belgian Congo, and how they taught the native tribes. When people came to Christ, they taught them to sing the great music of Bach in four-part harmony. They taught them incredible oratorios, African tribes dressed in loincloths with spears, learning to sing that music. And tremendous revival broke out in these demon-worshipping tribes. Okay, that brings us full back to circle, uh, full circle where we start today. So what does all this have to do with the glory of God? Sing to the Lord, part nine. How can we approach that question? How do you do it? I mean, we have the command, so how do you do it? When that covers everything in life, including music, where's the first handle that we can grab onto? And Paul gives us a hint, if you're taking notes, the first hint is in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. Paul says, and whatsoever you do, remember we're doing everything to the glory of God, he says, whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, not unto men. So there's going to be a contrast in what you are going to do to please men and what you're going to do to please God. Verse 17 in that same chapter gives us a little more insight. It says, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. It's going to produce some thanksgiving. So the two key elements, first of all, if you're taking notes, the first two key elements in verse 23 are these. Number one, it says, do it heartily. That means do it enthusiastically. Do it with all your heart. There is no room for dragging your feet when you're doing something for the glory of God. Did you get that? No room for dragging your feet when you're doing something for the glory of God. 
There's no room, for example, for being late when you're doing something for the glory of God. There is no room for claiming that you're glorifying God with a scowl on your face. I'm going to glorify God, and I really don't like it, but I'm going to glorify... That is not glorifying God. You cannot glorify God with a scowl on your face. You're to do it heartily, with all your heart, enthusiastically as unto the Lord. There is no room for sullenness or resistance or bitterness that God is making you do something that you'd rather not do because you hate it. That's not to the glory of God. When you are in the center of God's will... That should always cause you great joy, and not just great joy, listen carefully, when you are glorifying God, you are in the center of his revealed will, because he has commanded you to do all to the glory of God. In other words, do it with your heart, with your whole heart. Joy is one of the basic elements of the ninefold fruit of the Spirit. So doing to the glory of God, everything is essential to the production of the spiritual fruit of joy. You know, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. That's the ninefold fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Look at verse 17 again. That makes it clear that our words, as well as our actions, are in view when we do all to the glory of God. It says, whatsoever you do in word or deed. Verse 17 also makes it clear that what we must do must be done with the authorization or the authority of Jesus. It says, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, I've talked about this before, and you'll hear me talk about it again, because this is very important, especially in your prayer life. When we talk about name of Jesus, we're talking about his authority. We're talking about, and I think I gave this illustration to you some weeks ago, in that phrase, open in the name of the law. And I've preached on that in the past, and I hope you remember it, but if not, I'm going to say it again. Often we close our prayers with the phrase, in Jesus' name, amen. How many of you ever closed a prayer that way? You prayed your prayer and you said, in Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever, yeah, <laughs> yeah we, we close our prayers that way, don't we? In Jesus' name, amen. Why do we stick that on the end of our prayers? Because we want the Father to hear it, because we're say we're doing it in the name of Jesus. So this is for his glory. So if you answer this prayer request, it's for Jesus' glory. And so, Father, in Jesus' name, it's on his authority that we're asking these things from you. I hope you haven't forged Jesus' name at the end of some of your prayers. Some people do. Be careful about that because, you know, oftentimes we ask for things that are contrary to his revealed will in Scripture. And you cannot pray something in Jesus' name and sign his name to it if he himself would not sign his name to it. That's forgery. The charismatics love to shout in, the name of Jesus I command this or that. And they're using the name of Jesus like some kind of a magical incantation. But you can't use the name of Jesus that way. It's an abuse. John 14, 13, Jesus is talking. That's in the upper room discourse. Uh, that's the last time that Judas is with his disciples before they go to the garden and then he's taken prisoner and led away to be crucified. And Jesus says, and whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If it does not glorify the Father in the Son, it's an abuse of using the name Jesus. You can't do that. Now, uh, I think I shared with you, in fact, I know I shared with you some time ago, I made a resolution as a teenager that I don't care what other people think about me. I only care what Jesus thinks about me. That's a really good way to live your life. That way you're not pressured by peer pressure and all the kind of stuff that goes on, especially when you get to junior high age and then beyond. Um, because your peers mean an awful lot to you and you feel a lot of pressure from all those young people who are looking at you like you're, you know, came from Mars and you got green ears and, you know, two horns on top of your head. Uh, and then they laugh at you and they snicker behind your back and you want so badly to be in with the crowd. Just make that commitment. I really don't care what other people think about me. I only care what Jesus thinks about me because I want to bring him glory. I never want to bring him shame. He died for my sins. I don't want to commit more sins that bring shame to him. Every sin is like another nail in Jesus on the cross. 
did I give you guys the the illustration about uh, you and your friend Mary and you're mad at her and you're praying for her to get leprosy? <laughs> did, you, did I give you that illustration? Well, then let me give you that illustration. Pretend that you've just had a fight with your friend Mary. You're very mad at her. And so you pray, God, give Mary a horrible case of leprosy. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> now, you know, that's a blasphemous name with use of the name Jesus. And the promise that if we ask anything in his name, he will do it for us, it's, it's a misuse of that. That's like forging the name of a millionaire on a bad check. The millionaire has not authorized you to write that check and sign his name, and you will go to jail if you do it. How much more will happen if we think we can forge the name of Jesus on our carnal prayers as though his name was a magic formula? You cannot do it. Doing and saying things in the name of Jesus, and that includes our music, means we are doing and saying them with his authorization and his approval. There are things that Jesus would say and do, and Jesus always did the will of the Heavenly Father. That's why everything he did and said brought glory to God alone. Just attaching his name to something doesn't bring glory to God automatically. It may actually be an abuse, as we've said just a moment ago. Okay, so, so how do you apply that? Well, first of all, it does not mean that we isolate ourselves from other believers because we don't care what they think. So I said, you know, I don't care what other people think. I only think what, care what Jesus thinks. So therefore, I'm going to ignore all other Christians. That's not the point that I was trying to make. Instead, it informs us of the kind of interaction that we are supposed to have with others that pleases and therefore glorifies God. I think that's self Evident because the next few verses in Colossians 3 tell us how to glorify God in what we call interpersonal relationships. Verse 12, put on therefore. Now, whenever you see a therefore, ask yourself, what is it therefore? Because doing all to the glory of God will result in the specific external actions that Paul lists next. The external words, the external thoughts, the motives, the attitudes. After he said... Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus and do all to the glory of God. The very next thing he tells you is how to do it. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies. That's your emotions toward other believers. Kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness. Now, meekness is not weakness. Meekness is strength under control. Remember that. Meekness is strength under under control. Long-suffering, and I've told you the difference between long-suffering and patience. What's the difference? Long-suffering is putting up with people. difficult people. Patience is putting up with circumstances. difficult circumstances. Two different Greek words are used, and here he's telling you, you've got to learn to put up with difficult people. Long-suffering Forbearing one another ties right in. And forgiving one another. How many of you have a hard time forgiving? Yeah. You know, that's one of the things that doing all to the glory of God requires. Forgiveness. Friends, if Jesus hadn't died for your sins, where would you go when you die? You'd go to hell. Some of you have sinned more greatly, if you wish, than others. But even one sin is enough to throw you into hell. And Jesus suffered and died for you. And all of us have done more than one little sin. All of us. If God, for Christ's sake, forgave you, you need to learn to forgive others. I mean, really forgive them. Don't sit on it. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath, as James says. Make it right before the end of the day. Don't let it eat your guts out because bitterness in your heart will spring up and not only trouble you, but by it many others will be defiled, according to the book of Hebrews. Refusing to forgive produces bitterness. Bitterness destroys churches. 
Bitterness breaks fellowship. Bitterness kills people. You see, the appropriate results to, for doing all to the glory of God, doing everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, is it will give you a spirit of forgiveness. Three different things are listed here in this. For bearing one, long suffering, for long suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If you have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Paul knows that's a problem in the church. And above all these things, put on charity. That's agape. That's God's kind of love. You can't do it by yourself. This is not human love. There are different kinds of human love. There's phileo, that's brotherly love. There's storge, that's familial love. There's eros, that's erotic love. But he says, put on agape. Put on the kind of love that God had for you. That's the kind of love that we are supposed to be manifesting. And it is a result of doing all for the glory of God. Which is the bond of perfectness. That's maturity, that word there. So when you manifest agape love, you are demonstrating that you are a mature Christian. How many of you ever worry about anything? Just little things. Everybody worries. Yeah, we all worry about things, don't we? We hate to admit it, but we all do. We all worry about little. You know what it says in the next verse? When you're living this way and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, you never have to worry. The peace of God, the word translated rule there is the word for an umpire. One who calls out or safe. The peace of God will umpire in every situation that comes up in your life as a crisis. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body. Ah, the body is one. Paul explains that over in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through 14, where he talks about how God gives all the different gifts within the, the body of Christ so that we can complement one another, not so that we can be proud, not so that we can boast, not so that we can fight with each other, but because we are one body and Christ is the head. And the various members of the body are supposed to be functioning in obedience to the head. When the members of the body don't function in obedience to the head, there's something wrong with the body. When they're jerking around and acting spastic like this and not following directions from the head, it means there's something wrong. Paul reminds us of that here. To which you're called in one body and be ye thankful. Ah, and suddenly he moves from thanksgiving into singing from thanksgiving into music. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. In other words, music is firmly cemented in the center of the list and immediately precedes verse 17, which we read just a moment ago, and whatsoever you do in word or deed. That's right after you've been talking about singing and about music and the three different types of music that should be sung in the church. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. So he started with thanksgiving in verse 15. He talks about music in verse 16. He ends with thanksgiving in verse 17 and says you should do it all to the glory of God. That's key to that passage. Now we're going to talk about the distinction between those three different types of music later on. I won't get to it today. But what are the psalms? What are hymns in distinction from psalms? What are spiritual songs in distinction from psalms and hymns? The music that we sing in worship, because here we're commanded. Those are three things you're supposed to do. The music that we sing, the music that we listen to, how does it fit the category of psalms or hymns or spiritual songs? It's got to fit one of those categories, folks. Otherwise, it's not right. You can't use it in worship. Okay, well, we'll come back to that, the Lord willing. And then he goes on and talks about practical interpersonal relationships. So music, thanksgiving, and how does this relate to 
other relationships. Verse 18, he moves immediately into the marriage relationship. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Remember, back at the beginning of the passage, four things he said that we're supposed to be doing in relation to forgiveness because bitterness is so hard. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. If you're bitter against your wife, you're sinning directly against the word of God. If you have bitterness and anger in your heart against your wife, you are sinning against the word of God. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Oh, kids, we didn't want to hear that, did we? <laughs> I see some kids in the back grinning, <laughs> or at least one. <laughs> it's okay. God made the family, didn't he? God established the rules for the family, and when it works the way God said for it to work, everything goes well. In fact, he is glorified. That's the way in which families glorify God. And other families look and say, I really want to know what makes them like that. And suddenly your unsaved families around you will be drawn to you and you can lead them to Christ. I tell you, this is practical stuff, folks. Fathers, here's one for dads again. So we saw husbands, now we see fathers again. The men are going to get nailed three times in this passage. Kids get nailed once, women get nailed once, fathers get nailed three times. So, husbands love your wives, be not bitter against them. Now we have fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. And servants, there's the dads again, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singles of heart, fearing God. <laughs> men, you know the greatest burden is on us. All the wife has to do is obey. Because the husband represents Christ and the wife represents the church, the bride of Christ. But the husbands have to love their wives as Christ loved the church. How many of you think you are up to that? That's supernatural. You can't do it without the help of God. A wife can mechanically obey her husband. But a husband is commanded to love his wife in the same way that Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, willing to die for it. And a husband must be willing to die for his wife, to keep her safe, to save her, to keep her pure, to rescue her, to protect her from anything or anyone that would harm her in any way. Love your wives as Christ loved the church. And then our verse, whatsoever you do, and he's just gone through that list. He's just gone through that list. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. And then he gives you the warning. But he that doeth wrong... You blow it on any of those areas that he's just talked about. He that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. That's written to believers. Dear people, we don't take God seriously. And smack in the middle of that is a whole verse about music and the type of music we're supposed to have in worship. By the way, did you notice how many other of the nine facets of the fruit of the Spirit were mentioned in that passage that I just read? I didn't stop to point them out, but about doing all to the glory of God. We saw joy in that word heartily, but there's also the agape love, charity, in verse 14. There's peace in verse 15. There's meekness and long-suffering in verse 12. <laughs> all of ninefold fruit of the Spirit are in this passage. When you're doing all for the glory of God, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, show up in your life. That's one of the ways you test whether or not you're doing all for the glory of God. So, doing all for the glory of God certainly covers every area of interpersonal relationship, and the Bible gives us this specific detailed actions, words, thoughts, motives, and attitudes that God says are for his glory. 
There are instructions in Colossians 3 for the interaction with other believers in the church, verse 13. For interaction between employers and employees, verse 22. For interaction between husbands and wives and children and parents, fathers in particular, the children, verses 18 through 21. In other words, every area of life is covered in Colossians chapter 3 in the context of doing all for the glory of God. God gives us specific instructions how to do it. We don't have to guess. We don't have to make it up. God wants us to give him all the glory, so he has painstakingly set up the process for us step by step. In a nutshell, that is what's called living the Christian life. We talk about living the Christian life. Look at Colossians 3. That covers every different interaction of life that we have as people. It's called walking in the Spirit. It's called walking by faith. Or theologically, it's what's called progressive sanctification. And it happens when we focus on every detail. You know, you don't just say, well, you know, broad stroke brush, good enough for bro bro government work. When we focus on every detail in a manner that is in conformity with the revealed will of God for the Christian life. I wish we had time to go through chapter 3. We don't. But how the practical Christian life gives glory to God through interpersonal relationships, and that includes music. We're going to talk about how music is an interpersonal thing a little bit later on. But... It's very key, not merely in our relationship with God, but in our relationship with other people. Did you know that? And we'll talk about how after a while. I don't think I'll get that far today, but we'll try. Another example of how our relationship with other believers glorifies God is seen in Romans chapter 15, verse 7. For those who are taking notes, Romans 15, 7. Wherefore, receive ye one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Now, how did Paul say that Christ received us four things that were back there in Colossians 3, all related to what one word? Four things. Begins with an F. Ends with an S. Has a G in the middle. <laughs> Forgiveness! Okay, you got it, you got it, you got it. Okay, good, good, good job. Okay. <laughs> Are you awake out there? Hello. <laughs> okay, forgiveness. Well, now he says, receive you one another. We're all the way into the book of Romans, different book. Receive one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God. How did Christ receive us? With forgiveness. Oh, dear people, we need to learn to forgive. You will not walk the Christian life if you don't learn to forgive. You will not be walking in the Spirit if you do not know how to forgive. You will not grow in Christ if you do not know how to forgive. What's the worst? You don't have to say it out loud, but just the worst thing, think in your mind, that anybody in the world ever did to you. Have you in your heart forgiven them? Regardless of what they did and whether or not they repented, I mean, to accept forgiveness, you have to repent. But the forgiveness can be offered even if the other person doesn't repent. Have you forgiven them for what they did to you? Wherefore, receive ye one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God. So on one side of the coin, we see all of creation, especially believers, bringing glory to God. On the opposite side of the coin, we see God manifesting his own glory. You know, we looked at those passages over in Revelation where the whole creation is giving glory to God. But we also see God manifesting his glory. Music displays a major facet of this truth. Music is interpersonal for the most part. I mentioned that a moment ago. So now, let's talk about how is it interpersonal. There are composers. There are performers. There are listeners. Among the listeners... There are responders who are motivated to a great extent by the music. Music is an external expression of the inner life manifested in a visible way and portrays deeply what we are like on the inside. The music we like tells what we are like on the inside. In other words, music expresses what we believe about what we just talked about, living the Christian life. 
Music expresses what we believe about walking in the Spirit. Music expresses what we believe about walking by faith. Music expresses what we believe about progressive sanctification. The music we listen to and perform expresses both audibly and visibly what we believe about doing every detail in a manner that is in conformity with the revealed will of God, which we've just discussed, and in conformity with the Christian life. Either it manifests the glory of God or it does not. There are no middle options. And it says, do all to the glory of God. You've given a positive command. It doesn't say, do everything that's just so-so or, you know, to get by. It says, do all to the glory of God. So either the music manifests the glory of God or it does not manifest the glory of God. <clears throat> so we're going to look at the two things, how we give God glory and how God manifests his glory. I'm going to focus right now for a moment on how God manifests his glory. Just a few illustrations. Number one, one that you will all be familiar with because we've just gone through it in the book of Exodus. God manifested his glory to Moses at the burning bush when he declared his covenant name. That was over in Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 14. And I won't read you the whole passage, but you remember Moses is on the backside of the desert taking care of the sheep that belong to Jethro, his father-in-law, and he comes to the backside of the desert where Mount Horeb is located, located, and Suddenly he sees this bush that's burning. It doesn't seem to be burning up. He says, that's curious. And he walks over there and he looks at the bush and this flame is coming up out of it. And it's a big flame, but the bush is still there. It's not burning up. That's really weird. And as he gets close to the bush, God says to him, Moses, put off the shoes from your feet because the ground where you're standing is holy ground. God speaks to him out of the bush. He sees the glory of God and the glory of God attracts him. If you are manifesting the glory of God in your life, people will be drawn to Christ. If you are manifesting the glory of God in your music, people will be drawn to Christ. And Moses asks God, who are you? And he says, Behold, when I come to the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say unto me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. You know, Jesus quoted those words in John chapter 8, and the Jews picked up stones to stone him to death for blasphemy because they knew that he was claiming to be God. Jesus answered, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. The Jews said unto him, Now, Abraham was 2,000 years before Jesus, okay? The Jews said unto him, Thou art not yet 50 years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, Ego emi, I am. Then took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. They understood him, he said, I was before Abraham. It means he was before Moses. Moses is 1400 B.C. Abraham's 2000 before B.C. And he just claimed the covenant name of God for himself. Now, folks, either that's true or it's a lie. Either Jesus is who he said he was, or he's a, a liar par excellence, or he's a lunatic. Those are your only three options. But he demonstrated through what he did and how he lived and his death, burial, and resurrection, that he is who he said he is. He is the ego emi. I am the God who spoke to Moses at the burning bush. God was also manifesting his glory to Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6. Starting in verse 1, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, with twain he did fly. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Full of what? His glory. God is manifesting his glory. We're making some practical applications from when God manifests his glory and how we, who are supposed to be those who reflect his glory, should be living. 
And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. You know, just like the Shekinah glory connects Jesus to Abraham, even so the Shekinah glory of God connects Jesus to that magnificent vision of God's glory in Isaiah 6. In fact, the Apostle John specifically says so in John 12, 41, where John tells us that the glory of God that was seen in Isaiah was the glory of Jesus. Did you know that? John chapter 12, verses 38 through 41, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah, that's Isaiah, said again, he hath blinded their eyes, hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. Now listen to verse 41. These things said Isaiah, when he saw his, Jesus is the subject, we're talking about Jesus in this passage, when he saw his glory and spake of him. Isaiah chapter 6, who is the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and his train fills the temple, and the seraphim are surrounding him, and they're crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory, and the pillars of the temple are shaking, and the house, that is the temple, is filling with smoke. Who is it? John says it was Jesus. Folks, the scripture points to Jesus as God Almighty, the one to whom someday we will give an account. And we will give an account for our music. Now stop and think for a minute. Let's apply it to music. How does the music that you listen to reflect this kind of glory? Does it connect you to the glory of the Shekinah radiating around the throne of God? Does it make you bow before the God of heaven and earth? Isaiah fell on his face. That's why Paul can declare in Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Finish the verse for me. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory. the glory of God the Father. That's where it all is supposed to go. Not to the glory of the rock artist, not to the glory of the musician, not to the glory of the wiggling devotees that are out there in the audience. It should make you bow before the God of heaven and earth and give glory to the only one who deserves the glory. By the way, that quotation there out of Isaiah is also cited in Romans. Paul quotes it both in Philippians and also in Romans. Isaiah chapter 43, 23 said, I have sworn by myself the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return that to me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. And Paul said that back in Philippians. And Paul says it over in Romans, chapter 14, verse 11. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. I can't believe our time is up. We got a lot farther, though. <laughs> Covered some more material. These are the principles, folks. We need to learn that God cares about his own glory. We need to learn that music is one of the principal elements of worship. And we are called upon to worship him. That's why we gather on Sunday, not to have our ears tickled, not to have fun and fellowship. We gather together to worship the God of heaven who made us. And it is for his glory and for his glory alone. And music must do that. The Lord willing, we'll pick it up next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. As we learn the principles, and as we learn specific results for obeying the principles, as we've seen in Colossians chapter 3, how it affects every interpersonal relationship in life, how it 
is intimately connected with the fruit of the Spirit. How it makes a declaration audibly and visibly to the watching world that we do all to the glory of God. Father, take your word and let it not return unto you void, but let it accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.